Guaranteed, I had the best help today, so. He actually did, um, took a nap. I was actually able to type everything in that I needed to, even one-handed, one arm, one, I don't know how you say that, because it wasn't one hand. I'm not gonna try to explain it, but. How are y'all doing tonight? Well, Pastor Larry's good. I think we need to we need to do something and, and wish both uh, Pastor Larry and Karen a happy anniversary. So this is their anniversary. Thirty-one years. Did I get that right? Anyone that can stand you for thirty-one years deserves to be recognized. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Um, Anyway, tonight, tonight, we're, we're kind of, we finished, wrapped up our foundation series. If you haven't been here in, in a week or two, we wrapped up our foundation series a couple weeks ago, I believe. And um, last week, we, I kind of just took an opportunity to stay in the book of Matthew one last time. And you can go online and pick that up if you, if you would like to. Uh, we talked about the first will be last, I think is what I ended up calling that, the title of that message. But um, last week, so uh, feel free to jump online if you missed that. But tonight, and maybe actually for a couple more weeks, I'm not sure exactly how it's going to play out. I'd like to touch on the subject of worship. We just got done worshiping. So eloquent is the only word that comes in mind. I'm not sure it's exactly what I want to say, but so eloquently. So give Mr. Stephen a hand for that. They, he did an awesome job in leading us tonight. And, and, and uh, the reason why I said eloquently doesn't quite capture because I really felt like um, there's a sweet spirit in here when you all were worshiping tonight. How many, how many kind of sense that or, or just kind of, not that you have to feel it. And we're going to talk even more about that in the next couple weeks to come. And, and I think I even touch on it tonight, if I remember right. I've got lots of thoughts here, and I'm trying to get them down and organized. And it's been a crazy week a little bit, so some of that is not quite in my head at the moment. But I guarantee you I got it organized, and Silas helped me do it tonight, today, so this, this morning. But worship is an important part of connecting with God. You know, worship is a way that we connect with God. It's sometimes, sometimes, something that sometimes we tend to make way too religious or in a box. When I say that word to religious, I don't mean, you know, I'm not picking on any other churches or anything like that per se. But what I'm thinking, what I'm saying is, is our, our thinking gets trapped into a certain line or a certain way of what worship looks like. Since most churches spend a portion of every service or experience in worship, we can bring to form, or begin to form an idea of what worship should look like or what it should consist of because we see it modeled every week and maybe twice a week, right? But one of the aspects of worship is simply to be in God's presence. How many can agree with that? Yeah. So the giving a, this message a title tonight. My title of my message is Residing in His Presence. Now, I, I kind of changed the title quite a bit, and I was saying, what is it, taking up residence in His, in his presence? And then all of a sudden, I was like, I could shorten this. Residence in His presence. And then this afternoon, I got back, and I'm like, that is so corny. And so, <laughs> And so I changed it. I was like, what were you even thinking? So I was trying to shorten the title. I don't like super long titles. But, but anyway, the title's not important as much as the subject, obviously. But residing in his presence. You know, David spoke of residing in the presence of the Lord. In Psalms 42, verse 1, it says, As the deer longs for streams of water, so I long for you, O God. I thirst for God, the living God. When can I go and stand before him? He goes on in, in Psalms in chapter 84, it says, A single day in your courts is better than a thousand anywhere else. I would rather be a gatekeeper in the house of my God than live the good life in the homes of the wicked. Doesn't that just sound so awesome? 
I mean, I, I have to admit, growing up, those two, those two passages of Scripture are one of my favorites. How many, how many, anybody else? Can I get a witness? Can I get anybody else say, yeah, they're, they're, they're favorites of theirs? Okay, I'm not alone. That's good. I don't like being alone always. Sometimes it's okay. But David spoke of residing in the presence. So how do we reside in God's presence? If we look at those two scriptures as an example, and there's, there's a lot, lot more for time's sake. I just kind of narrowed it down to, to those two. But in light of what David is saying, do we go to church to reside in God's presence? It kind of sounds that way, doesn't it? I'd rather be in, you know, uh, a, a, a single day in your courts. That's new living. And I believe King James and New American Understand says, better is one day in your courts. And they wrote a song after that version, right? Better is one day in your... I won't sing. And everybody said amen. No, in order for us to reside in the presence of God, do we spend all of our time at church? No. And that may have caused many to gasp in shock. But it's true. Residing in the presence of God doesn't require you to come to church. Okay then, Pastor Kevin, what do you do about Psalms 84.10, huh? You just read it. What do we do with that? Well, I think we need to take a step back and analyze that scripture once more and look at it, okay? David wasn't necessarily longing for the temple of God and to be at the temple of God, which is there, what we now call church. church. Making sure if anybody's awake out there listening. Yes, he was longing to reside in God's presence, right? Can we agree with that? It wasn't necessarily the building he longed for. It was being in God's presence. Can we at least agree on that one? Even if I cause some of you to gasp, okay? So, and we can even see that better in, in the same version of, of that's, that's translated in the Passion Translation because it's, it actually says, and do, we, do you have that one? Because I actually, I was rearranging my notes. This is one part that Silas did not help me on and I did myself. And, and I meant to copy and paste and change it. There it is. For just one day of intimacy with you is like a thousand days of joy rolled into one. I'd rather stand at the threshold in front of the gate beautiful, ready to go in and worship my God than to live my life without you in the most beautiful palace of the wicked. Does that give a little bit better light on it? He talks about intimacy. He doesn't talk about a building. It isn't about a church. And yet, in the 80s and 90s, I can remember me thinking that I had to live in church. We had to have prayer meetings in church. We had to come to church and get together. Why? Because better is one day in your courts. We got to get to church. Come on, right? We lived in the day of Sunday morning, sometimes Sunday morning services, two services, three services, Sunday night services, Wednesday night services, Bible group studies. It is a full-time job just to come to church. And that was in the 80s, and now I wonder why we have so many broken homes. Just throwing that out there. Because I think we kind of got the right idea or concept, the wrong application. Would that be right? Because it isn't church where we reside in the presence of God. Now, do I believe we need to come to church? Absolutely. I'm here, and so are you. So I think we're on the same page, right? But I'm not talking about the importance of coming to church tonight. I'm talking about residing in his presence. And you do not need to come to church to reside in his presence. And we're going to look at that and study that tonight. Okay? Because the, the other side of it is, is, is the scripture that we just read, that they just put up on the screen. Come on, this is really basic, guys. Is this Old Testament or New Testament? Is Psalms in the Old Testament or the New Testament? Old Testament. Old Testament. Now, as you was with us, if you had been with us um, in our series Covenant, we learned that the word for testament is also the same word for covenant, right? And under the old covenant, we know the presence of God was limited to a building. Is that right? 
The presence of God was contained within the Holy of Holies in the temple. Yes? That was the old covenant. But we are no longer under the old covenant. Am I right? No, we have a new covenant, okay? Also called the New Testament. And within this new covenant, the presence of God no longer resides in a building. We see this made evident when Jesus was on the cross in Matthew chapter 27, verse 50. It says, Jesus passionately cried out, took his last breath, and gave up his spirit. At that moment, the veil in the holy of holies was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook violently, rocks were violently split apart. What was the significance of that? It was God, or we could even maybe say, we could stretch it to say the Holy Spirit, the manifested presence of God, that said, I am no longer confined to a room within a building. Why? Because Jesus came, he established a new covenant based on what does the word say? Better promises, and no longer is my presence confined to a room within a, within a building. Well, where is it if it's not in a room within a building? We see that the presence of God now resides on the inside of you. Well, I need scripture for that. I can give you more than one, actually. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. Have you forgotten that your body is now the what? Sacred temple of the spirit of holiness who lives in you? You don't belong to yourself any longer for the gift of God. The Holy Spirit lives inside what? Your sanctuary. You were God's expensive purchase. Paid for with tears of blood. So by all means then use your body to bring glory to God. You see God's presence doesn't live in a building in a room. It lives on the inside of you. Galatians chapter 2 verse 20, my old self has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives what? In me. Where's God's presence? On the inside of you. John 16 7, but in fact, it is best for you, this is Jesus speaking here, that I go away because if I don't, the advocate, whom is what, who? The Holy Spirit won't come. If I do go away, then I will send him to you. Well, if I send him to you, where will he be? John 14, 16, Jesus explains further. And I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate or the Holy Spirit who will never leave leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads you into all truth. The world cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize him. But you know him because he lives with you now and later will be in you. Now Jesus is speaking to the disciples here. And we know that this is true because this was before Acts chapter 2 happened, right? And then in Acts chapter 2, on the day of Pentecost, when they were all in the upper room, it said the Holy Spirit came like a wind, right? A rushing mighty wind, I believe, is the exact exact words used there. And so that's why Jesus was saying, lives with you and later will be in you. Are we living in the now or the later? The later, because Acts chapter 2 already happened, right? And so now the Holy Spirit is not with the disciples. He is or was in the disciples, right? Do you see the timeline there? The chronolo- chronology. Did, did, I, did I lose anybody? Say, say yes, I understand. Sweet. Okay. Just don't want to leave. No one left behind. Okay. Um, so residing in his presence doesn't require us to come to a building. In fact, mind blower, it's actually the opposite. Now, very often on a Sunday morning, when I, as I welcome all of you to church and thank you for coming, I will say thank you for bringing the church into the building. The reason I do that is the building doesn't make up the church. You do, right? It's people. The church is the people. It's not a building. And it's true, actually, for the presence of God. God's presence doesn't reside in this building. (gasps) stand back he's going to get hit by lightning no you bring the presence of God with you when you come into the building 
So I could very well say on a, any given Sunday morning, thank you for bringing the presence of God with you this morning. Why? Because he lives in you and resides, or lives, resides with you and lives in you. Yes? Well then, Pastor Kevin, if the Holy Spirit lives in me, why don't I feel his presence on the inside of me? This is a very um, bona fide question. Very, very good question. Because I know oftentimes when we come to church, we may get some feels, right? Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with those at all. Nothing at all. And we're going to talk more about that stuff next week, God willing. But tonight, I want to address the, the idea of if the Holy Spirit is always living in me, why do I sometimes feel so alone? In fact, why do I sometimes feel like I'm in a desert? You don't have to raise your hand on that one if you're there or have been there. God and the Holy Spirit is not in your soul. What is your soul? Your mind, your will, and your emotions. God is not a God of your soul. He is a God of your spirit because the Holy Spirit is spirit. John 4, 23, but the time is coming. Indeed, it is here now when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father is looking for those who will worship him that way for God is spirit. So those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. God is not a God where you find him in your emotions. That is why feelings can be fleeting. Fleeting, I should say. There may be times when you are in church and you have all kinds of feelings. Well, is that wrong? No, it's not wrong. But our relationship with God should not be based on feelings or emotions because that's not who God is. Yeah. Now, we are a three-part being, spirit, soul, and body. And you know what? I truly believe as one part is, 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 is changed, is experiencing something, the other parts are affected. In fact, I even got some scientific proof for that. Don't have time to get into that because I don't want to teach it and I don't want to just throw it out there. I don't like preachers that vomit stuff and then don't explain it. So I'm not going to be one of those. Okay. But it is true. And so when something is moving inside of you in your spirit, it can affect your, your emotions, your mind, will, and emotions. It could even affect your body. I have had it affect my body. I have literally more so it seems like back in power up kids than I have here. I don't know. Maybe there's more um, um, spiritual warfare dealing with power up kids because they are the future church of America. By the way, how many of you, can I just see with people standing who, do we have anybody that serves in power up kids? Any area, any area. Infants, stand up, would you? Give these guys a round of applause. You can be seated. I had somebody that when I, um, I actually was, was serving here at the church, working in an area before I went into kids, and they said, well, I hope you enjoy it. Sorry, it's kind of like a demotion. I was like, what are you talking about? Working with kids is the best place I'd rather be. I mean, where else can you affect a generation than power up kids, than our kids? It's an honor and a, and, a, and a privilege to serve back there. So thank you, every one of you that volunteer to do that, to shape our, the future of our church. Not just this church, but the church as in the body of Christ. But where was I even going with that? Oh, I can remember times when I literally was sick. Physically sick. But guess what? There's only one kid's pastor. And when... You've got volunteers that are already doing, juggling all kinds of things already. There's not somebody else to pick up the slack. So what do you do? 
You go on. And I remember times when I was physically sick, I would get up to minister God's word and I would feel completely fine. In fact, I would feel amazing. And then about an hour or two later after church was over, I was sick again. What is that? I think it's the Holy Spirit. The anointing of God. And it does affect the different parts of our being. But the fact of the matter is God is still spirit. And that is what he has moved in. And that is where we access his presence is through spirit, not through emotions. And that's where I feel like emotions can be all over the map. You can be in a place where, you know, the worship leader, uh, the pastor, the someone else is just saying, man, I just felt God's presence all over me. And you may be sitting there, I got nothing. And you know what? It's okay. Because God is not a God of emotion. He is a God of? Oh, come on. There's people that know the answer of this question more than Pastor Larry. He is a God of? Spirit, thank you. So we must come to him in spirit if we are to talk and to reside with God. God is a holy God and we must be holy and our spirits are transformed and made holy, holy when we come into relationship or come into covenant with him. This means, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, this means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. You see, our spirits are transformed immediately. Our minds are transformed when they are renewed. Romans 12, 2, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable. How do we renew our minds? We renew our minds by the word of God. What is the will of God? The word of God, right? Are you following me? So our spirits are transformed immediately. Our minds, our souls are being transformed by the renewing of the word and our bodies will never be transformed. They will continue to decay and they will be killed. It is appointed unto man once to what? Die. Okay. What about the resurrection? Well, that's a whole different deal and a whole different teaching, okay? But they still, these bodies disappear. Now, those who belong to Christ Jesus crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. So that is why God, we speak to God through our spirit because God is a holy God and your spirits are made holy. We are made righteous, right? Righteousness is, is, well, I'm going to go into that a little later um, because I'm running out of time and I've still got notes. I'm on page five out of nine. So let me, let me keep on, on, on my notes here. So since you take the presence of God, the temple with you, everywhere you go, since he lives in you, take up residence in his presence. You don't have to come to church to get a fix of the presence of God. That's the important thing that I wanted to get to. Because that's where real life happens. The world and the things of this world, along with the play-by-play that the enemy is sure to run through your mind, all the negatives, the things designed to steal and kill and destroy, wear you down. They wear you down. I don't even have to ask for a show of hands because I know every hand would be up if anybody has ever been worn down, overwhelmed, stressed, however you put it. And thinking on them or overthinking them is the root of a stronghold of the enemy in your life. I truly believe that. We hear about strongholds, and and I'm not going to go into teaching about strongholds, but I really truly believe that a stronghold starts with a thought. And then we think on that thought and we overthink and we overthink and we overthink. And it opens the door for him to work in our lives. Get into his presence by tapping into your spirit who is partnered by the Holy Spirit who lives on the inside of you as a child of God. That changes everything. 
And you don't have to come to church to make that happen. You can take church with you 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. And you need to. Because the devil doesn't take any vacations. So we can't afford to either. Take God's presence with you. Reside in his presence. How do we do that? Well, first of all, realize that God is there in the first place. Remember, you take his presence who resides with you and in you everywhere you go. And I think we often forget about this. Because of the way that we have been I don't want to say brainwashed, but I guess routined into how we do things. Worship. Oh, yeah, that's from 9 to 920. No, it's not. Okay, yes, it is here during our service, but it doesn't stop there and it should not. Can I get an amen? Amen. It should happen everywhere you go, every chance you get. You mean... Am I going to be singing worship songs while I'm working? Stephen, while I'm teaching, he's up there singing. No, that's not what I mean. But stick with me and you'll, you'll get what I'm talking about, okay? So, but the first thing is realize that God is with you, that God is there. We forget this. Or maybe it never dawned on you until this teaching. And that, that's, that's good. That's good. I'm glad you're here to, 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 to hear it tonight. The next thing is, is we need to encourage yourself In the Lord. David did this. Go back in the book of of Psalms and you'll see where David encouraged himself. No, I'm sorry, it's not in Psalms, it's in the book of Samuel, where he encouraged himself in the Lord. The devil is oftentimes relentless at his game. And sometimes we do our part to help him along by not being disciplined in our thoughts. That's all I'll do to step on toes there, but I've been there too. I do it. Why? Because he gets a thought in our head and we tend to think about it and think about it and overthink it and blow it up. I do it too. And so what do we do? We need to do what David did to counteract his schemes and encourage yourself in the Lord. What's the best way to encourage yourself in the Lord? Worship. And guess what? You can do that all day long. I can worship God when I'm mowing the lawn. I can worship God when I'm sanding and painting doors, which I'm doing this week, and I hate it. I am not a painter, but the good thing is I have one door left and one side left, and it will be done by tomorrow morning, and I will dance for joy. But I can still, even though I don't like doing sanding and painting doors, I can still worship while I'm doing them, and I do. When I'm in my office, and Lord, McKenna makes fun of me, I'll, I'll just say that when I'm mowing the lawn, because last summer, um, she planted a garden, her and Andy Barnett planted a garden out of my place, and she said it was really cute because she could hear, because I've got these earbuds that I put in, and they, like, noise cancel, so you can't hear the mower, you know, the mow, you know, because normally use headphones to make sure you don't damage your ears. Well, I just put these noise-canceling earbuds in, and I'm listening to Maverick City music worship while I'm mowing the lawn, and she said, he's just singing out there, not even realizing how loud I am singing, and you know what? I live on 10 acres outside of town, and I don't really care. Trust me, I've heard neighbors saying a whole lot worse things at 11 o'clock at night than my worship. So guess what? I'm going to sing just as loud as I want to sing. And she wasn't getting on me. She actually thought it was cute. But I sing when I'm mowing the yard. I worship God while I'm mowing the yard. Why? Because I need it. I need to reside in his presence. Because when I do that, it changes me. It changes my mindset. It changes my, I'll hear a word in the song and all of a sudden, I mean, I'm painting and all of a sudden, man, I'm painting faster. Why? Because something hits me, a phrase in a song hits me and I'm like, that's true. Doggone it, the enemy's been trying to convince me the opposite of that all this time and that is true. And I get a hold of that and I'm like, yeah. Yeah. Why? Because I need it. How many of you, come on, how many of you 
No, don't raise your hand. How many of you have been bombarded by the enemy over and over and over about one single thought and all of a sudden Pastor Larry says one thing that just totally sets you free? Did you know you could experience that on a daily basis if you just take time to worship him? And you don't have to. Now, when I'm doing all of this, I've got earbuds in and I'm listening, listening to Maverick City worship or something like that. I'm stuck on them lately. I, I, well, I know why. I need it. What they have, I need. But it doesn't have to be that. It's whatever you want to do, whatever you feel like. I think music is a great part. It doesn't have to be the only part. There are times when I'm just spending time in God's presence and there's no music playing at all. In my office doing something else, but my head is somewhere else because it needs to be. Or I should say my spirit is somewhere else because it needs to be. But the encouraging yourself in the Lord, the biggest thing is being intentional. In fact, I had a conversation about this the other night. Be intentional. Don't just put on Christian radio. Why? Because it may not be what you need. Don't just put on, put on good praise and worship that you connect with. That's different for each and every one of us. Like I said, Mav City, there may be someone in here that says, I hate Mav City. Okay, don't listen to it. It's okay. You're not going to offend me. Find what you do like. I don't care if it's Sandy Patty, okay? But find what you can worship God with. Because it's important. It may be different for each of us. It's important. So be intentional. Come on, with Spotify, YouTube, Apple Music, um, Google Music, Amazon, you can be intentional to pick something that's going to get you to that place where you enter into worship. Yeah, but that costs money. I mean, have you seen those Spotify, those subscriptions? I mean, they're diming you all every month. Oh, please, come on. Most of us here spend money on what we want to spend money on. You who bought a new boat, a camper, a motorcycle, a bow, a gun. I purchased Apple Music for $15 a month and my whole family gets to enjoy it because I family share the plan. I'm going to step on toes, but many of you in here spend more on 7 Brew in a week than I spend on Apple Music in a month. So you can choose to spend what you want to choose to spend your money. Now, there may be some people in here that cannot, and I don't want to step on any toes because I don't want to offend anybody. If you cannot... I've been there and done that, but there's free stuff you can get too to be intentional. That's the point. And I can be out in my shop, in my bedroom, in my bathroom, or out in the living room, or even in my office and have Maverick City Worship encouraging me that God performs a million little miracles in my life, too many to count, instead of letting the enemy fill my head with all that I lack and everything that's going bad in my life. Come on. That's the reason why I'm speaking about this. It's not to say, don't come to church and enter into worship, Stephen, is it? No, it's the fact that we need to take what we get here out there because out there is where the battles are happening. And out there is where God is going to transform you. I have seen so many of the disciples that were transformed, had monumental growth spurts, and they never, not one of them happened when they were in the temple. It was always out there. Peter faced the rooster crowing out there, not in church. And it forever changed his life. But it didn't overwhelm him. Why? Because I believe he dug deeper than what the enemy wanted him to. Why do I know that? Because Judas went out and hung himself and Peter did not. What was the difference? I am not sure, but I have a feeling it was because Peter grabbed on to something where Judas could not. Guys, the real battle is out there. And the real battle is where you need to be taking up residence in God's presence. Where things are trying to overwhelm you. But you don't know what Sally down the street said about me and is telling everyone. And I don't care what even Sam down the street is saying about me because I've taken time to spend in worship to hear what Jesus is saying about me. 
And I think he holds more weight than Sam and Sally put together about either one of us. And don't get me wrong, I care about what you care about. In fact, I care enough to let you in on how you can get rid of that. That worry, that care. Jesus said, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. But unless you take time to encourage yourself in that, the enemy will eat your lunch, guys. Because he's real good at playing that over and over in this mind, this battleground of his. And that's when you need to take charge and begin to change. And I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna hit on something that goes a little bit beyond worship, but I think is very important and very key and something we can access very well as we reside in the presence of God. is so when we take up residence with Jesus in his presence, he can teach and train you how to take your thoughts captive. Those thoughts that aren't good. We tend to let our minds think about whatever it, it is and chooses to think about. And the enemy will be sure to fill it with things that will steal, kill, or destroy. John 10.10, 10, Jesus said he would. But we can choose to harness our thoughts and only think on things that are good. Philippians 4.8, I'm going old school, New American Standard on this. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, think about these things. So if Paul instructed us to restrain thoughts, we should be able to do this because he wouldn't give you something. Jesus wouldn't put something on your plate that you can't do. So if Paul instructed us, how do we do it? If you're saying, I can't, let me show you how. And I'm going to use the Bible to show us. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5, we are destroying arguments and all arrogance raised up against the knowledge of God and we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. What does that mean? We analyze every thought according to Philippians chapter 4, 8. Whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable. And if it doesn't line up, we refuse to think about it. We analyze every thought according to God's word. And if it doesn't line up, we refuse to think about it. But how in the world do you do that? That's a good question. The thought comes through your head, you're a lousy husband. And the first thing I might think about is, yeah, I am a lousy husband. But does it line up with Philippians 4.8? Does it line up with the rest of the word, God's word? Well, today it doesn't. <laughs> there may be times in my life when I have to repent and ask for forgiveness because I was being a lousy husband. And if you are, make it right. <laughs> but as de by default, no, you are not. So then I say, no, I'm not a lousy husband. I take that thought captive and I refuse to think about it. Well, we all know we can't just refuse to think about anything. That would create a vacuum. And guess what? That doesn't happen in your mind. Did you know you, your mind continues to think even after you go to sleep? Right? We can't turn this thing off. And the moment we say, I refuse to think about this, you've just given it a topic to continue to think about. Ice cream. Now, if you were thinking about ice cream before, that doesn't apply to you. But if you weren't thinking about ice cream, I bet you are now. Why? Because I said it. And many of you are right now saying, DQ is on my way home. See, we can't just not think about something. We have to replace it with something else. So what do we do? That thought, I'm a lousy husband? No, I'm not. And then I'm going to go to God's word and find out what I am. I'm going to find out, no, I am not. I'm going to take that thought captive. I refuse to think about that. I am not a lousy husband. And I'm going to compare it to what the word says about me. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I have the mind of Christ. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. I am God's masterpiece created for good works. I can do all things through Christ who gives me a strength. And that even means being a good husband. I have the wisdom of God and not the wisdom of this world. That's what God's word says about me. Not that I'm a lousy husband. 
Do you, do you see that? That was just one little, simple, little, easy example. When we reside in God's presence, when we encourage ourselves, it gives us the fuel we need to do things just like that. But if you don't have that, and we let our minds just think about whatever it wants to think about, you can guarantee you it's going to be negative and it's not going to line up with Philippians chapter 4, verse 8, because the enemy, this is his playground. And you continue to hear that and continue to hear that and you're not residing in the presence of God, it will wear you down. And it will overwhelm you. But God didn't intend it to be that way. That's why he ripped the veil in two and said, no longer is my presence confined to a building or a room within a building. I am putting my presence inside of each of my kids and you can access that presence anytime you want to. Now, Bill Sharpless says, in conclusion, God's presence doesn't reside in a church building. God's presence resides in you. You can access and reside in his presence when you access the spirit. We often do that when we get our minds quiet and listen to our spirit. Because our spirit partners with the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is the ever-present presence of God on the inside of us. On the inside of you. You can do this anytime, anywhere. And not only can you, you need to. Can we come to church and experience God's presence? Absolutely, because you bring it with you. Should we come to church and experience God's presence? Absolutely. And God willing, I'm going to touch on that next week and talk about the difference of residing in his presence and the difference of corporate worship. There are definitely advantages, but there are limitations as well. Plan on coming out to get the details on that because I am not slamming corporate worship. I am just saying that we need more than just corporate worship or we will drown. God didn't make you to drown. He made you to swim. In fact, he made you to soar. You can reside in his presence every day and everywhere. And you don't have to get feels to know you are. Would you stand with me to pray? Father, I thank you, God, for your ever-present, ever-presence in our lives. And God, that we can rest in confidence, knowing, God, that when we're going through one of the hardest choices, one of the hardest decisions, one of the hardest battles of the enemy, that you are there. You said you would always be there, even to the end of the age. Even when we are alone, we are not alone. And so, Holy Spirit, my prayer is as we leave this building, as we lead maybe an atmosphere, an environment where in a corporate body joined together, it's easy to feel uplifted it's easy to feel good even when we hear the word preached it's easy to be uplifted it's easy to be feel good but God when we get into the battle father that's where we need to feel your prayer to know you're there not to feel your presence to know you're there that's when we need to be encouraged and being able to tap into that presence always God, that is such a game changer. Father, my prayer is that each and every one of of us, including myself, would begin to spend time in your presence each and every day. Maybe it starts with 10 minutes, maybe 15. And maybe it grows. And God is not the posture of our body that matters 
when we worship you. It's the posture of our heart. And that doesn't just apply to church. That applies everywhere we go. I love to dance and sing and shout and get excited for Jesus. But I don't need to do that to reside in your presence and neither do any of us. And so God, teach us, help us, grow us to reside in your presence, Father, even in the midst of the battle. And we thank you and we receive it. Some of us maybe have to just even receive it by faith. I don't understand all of that, but I am going home to spend time with God daily. Father, teach us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. I did put an announcement out there, um, and it was really, really late, so I'm going to make everybody know if you're not a part of Helping Hands, you can still help out with this. We have a young lady that is in need of someone Saturday afternoon, some muscles to help her unload. She's got people to load, needs some help to unload at 2 o'clock this Saturday. If you can help, you can see me. It's on our Helping Hands event on our website as well, all the details. But um, if you can help out, let me know. Thank you. God bless you. We'll see you Sunday. Have a great week.